the battles of Armageddon and the saving of the tents of Judah first, the Jews that live in the land, known today as the Israelis. But of course you'll recall that there are two grand phases of God's work of saving Israel, and so after that very ferocious invasion by the Gogian Confederacy uh, and the redemption of the house of, uh, of Judah, then the process needs to take place about the rest of the world as well. So what's going to happen with the other 8.5 million Jews, or thereabouts, that are still dispersed around the world? What's going to happen with the saving of those who are biblically known as Israel, the scattered of Israel? And that's actually where our story becomes rather riveting, because it, it ushers in um, an approximately 40-year period of the most extraordinary and, and dynamic events imaginable. Now, quite early in that process, after the kingdom is established, there will be an ultimatum sent forth from Christ and the saints out to the nations, uh, and we pick it up, of course, in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7, the Midheaven Proclamation. I saw another angel, a symbol of a mighty messenger, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And the demand that goes forth to the nations, the instruction to them, will consist of two basic messages. The first will be to submit to God, as represented by Christ and the saints in this new kingdom, and secondly also to let Israel go, to let the Jews amongst their nations go, and to send them or allow them to return back to the land of Israel. Now one of the very best illustrations of the process that will take place is the historical exodus of Israel from the land of Egypt and then their period of their subsequent wanderings in the wilderness before they entered the land. Now we're actually told in scripture quite explicitly that the pattern or the story of the exodus under Moses is an absolute pattern of what's going to be taking place in the future. We know that from passages such as that one in Micah and chapter 7. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvellous things. So we're being directed to look back at the days of their coming out of the land of Egypt because there will be this um, correlation between the two. Micah chapter 7 and verse 15. Ezekiel chapter 20 has a, a very interesting little section from verses 34 to 38. And I have some extracts from it there on the screen. We're speaking of that time of the restoration of Israel. God says, I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries where, wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So God's telling us that just as it says that he pleaded with them in the wilderness as they had from the land of Egypt, so he will do the same again. Just as he brought them out with a mighty hand from Egypt and brought them to the land, so he will do again. And so those two passages, Micah and Ezekiel, make it very clear that the, the exodus under Moses is a pattern of what will take place in the future as those scattered of Israel will be brought back and they'll go through a process uh, of being reconciled to God. There's a process of being brought into the bond of the covenant. There's a process of being passed under the rod as well. So what did happen in the story of Exodus? In fact, if I just go back there, there's a little statement actually. Um, in fact, maybe we should turn up Ezekiel. There's another little statement there which is, which is worth having a look at that, that shows us that not only will it be based upon the, uh, the Exodus, but actually it will, it will eclipse the drama and the power of that previous record. Let's have a look at Ezekiel and chapter 20. <clears throat> 
Ezekiel chapter 20, you can see the section that we have quoted there from verse 34 through to verse 38. But what I particularly want to pick up is the little phrase um, <clears throat> in verse, I have lost it now, well, let's pick up in verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I roll over you and I'll bring you out from the people. I'll gather you out of the countries where you're scattered with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. Bring you into the wilderness in verse 35 and plead with you face to face like I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt in verse 36. And he goes on to talk about the fact, and I can't see it right now, but it talks about the fact that it will no longer be said that they came out of the land of Egypt, but it will be a, a, an exodus which actually eclipses the power of the land of Egypt itself. And they will know, in verse 44, that he is Yahweh. So it's going to be a very dramatic process that is based upon the exodus from the region of Egypt. But what did actually happen there? If you take your mind back, how did that process actually begin? Can you remember the feisty words of Moses? when he stood before Pharaoh, and he said, rather, thus saith Yahweh, let my people go. There's no misunderstanding what his message was. So what was Pharaoh's rather furious response? Well, he said, who is Yahweh that I should let his people go, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not Yahweh, neither will I let Israel go. And so there ended up being two parts here, I don't know God, so I won't obey his voice, and neither will I let Israel go. And those are the two matters that then became the context between God and Pharaoh, to submit to the will of God and to let Israel go. Now I can imagine the nations of the earth absolutely hating a message to them which says that they need to submit to Christ and let the Jewish people go. Now, do we want to know how much the, the, the nations hate Israel today? Well, just look at the vote that took place in December 2017. After America decided they would recognise Jerusalem as being the capital of Israel, there was 148 nations of the world that voted at the United Nations against America's recognition of Jerusalem as being the capital of Israel. So just wait until a Jew the Lord Jesus Christ, in power in Jerusalem, demands their national submission and the abdication of the government of each country. They will be so, so incensed, they will be almost incoherent with rage. You know, scriptures have depicted all of this before, in the typical stories in scripture which foreshadow that great work. What happened in the past when a Jew returned to help the returned captivity rebuild a destroyed land. Think of the days of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now that whole story actually is a remarkable pattern of this future time goes through in quite remarkable detail. Even the, the different decrees of the Persian kings have their parallel in the work of restoration in the future. Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is very descriptive. It, it tells us about the nations raging. In fact, let's have a look at Psalm 2 because it, it's quite explicit. It tells us exactly what the nations will say. And I can imagine the United Nations getting together, ambassadors scurrying backwards and forwards, in fury and, 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 and rage, when the, when the command comes forth from the Lord Jesus Christ that all nations need to submit. Psalm 2. Now we know what time period we're talking about here in this prophecy because Psalm 2, it says, Yet, in verse 6, Have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion? So this is the prophecy of a time period after Christ has been established in king, um, as king in Zion. But it starts off in verse 1, why do the nations rage? The people imagine a vain thing. 
the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And you can imagine the anger and the frustration in the nations as they have this requirement come and they all take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying there is no way that we are going to submit to this requirement that's been sent to us from the land of Israel. Daniel chapter 7, interesting, in, the, in the, uh, the voice of the great words which the little horn speaks against the saints. Now, of course, that, that covers historically a long period of time as the papacy was speaking against the saints. But it's interesting, reading Daniel chapter 7 carefully, the voice of the great words of the horn are being spoken at the time that that beast is actually destroyed. Because it will be true to form. The Catholic system itself will be raging against a Jewish person that has set up a new basis of worship in the land of Jerusalem. No doubt that's when the Catholic Church will denounce Christ as being the Antichrist. And they'll hate him because of what he requires and, of course, because of his Jewish origins. Now, unfortunately, at that point, a, uh, a really evil and sinister thought will come into their mind. What happened when Haman got enraged at Mordecai the Jew? Because that whole story of Esther is again a pattern of this work, both of the persecution and then the redemption of the Jewish people. I'm just going to read these words to you from Esther chapter 3, and I want you to hear the evil that is spoken in these words. Esther 3 verse 6, And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. And Haman said to, Ahasuer, uh, to King Ahasuer, Ahasuerus, There's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it's not for the king's profit to suffer them. Now, if it please the king, let it be written that they be destroyed. And that's exactly the pattern that will take place again. The nations will try and attack Christ and the saints, and a terrible persecution will break out against the Jews that are living scattered amongst the nations of the earth. And then at that point the scene is set for some rather dramatic events. Now at this point in our story we need to just stop and think for a moment about leadership. If this event is being compared to the exodus under the leadership of Moses, does that mean that there will be a corresponding leader, someone like a Moses, who will actually lead the process of gathering Israel and rescuing them from the nations and bringing them back through this wilderness journey back into the promised land? And the answer to that is emphatically yes. There is a man who was specially prepared for that task. One whose previous life was designed to mould, to fashion him, to convert him, and to hone him, to develop the qualities that are needed here for that particular work of the future. And leading that second exodus is the greatest life work of none other than Elijah the prophet. Now remember, of course, we've got the, the passage in Exodus 36 that we looked at earlier, that the work of restoration will be to change their hearts. And I mentioned the fact that that's a phrase which comes up often in terms of the restoration of Israel. In Elijah's former work, what was the most dramatic event that took place in Elijah's life? Any suggestions? What was the, most, the largest event that we think of? If we think about the work of Elijah, what was the largest, most dramatic public event? Any suggestions? Mount Carmel, excellent, Mount Carmel. And what were the words that, that Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel? I've got them here on the screen. First of Kings 18, verse 37. Hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Yahweh God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So even in his first work, Elijah was involved in this process of turning the hearts of the people back to God. 
Now those events, and particularly also his, uh, his, uh, the event of the still small voice and the lessons he learnt on Mount Sinai or on Horeb, those lessons prepared Elijah for the greater work still to come. And they become key elements of his future work. So I'd like you to come with me to Malachi chapter 4, which is the reading which was read as an introduction for us this afternoon, where it makes it very clear that it's Elijah specifically who will be involved in that work. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So it's quite explicit here. There's a statement that Elijah the prophet is going to be sent before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, and notice what he's going to do. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children in verse 6. So this work of changing people's hearts, of turning people's hearts, that we saw spoken of earlier this afternoon in the book of Ezekiel, that work of changing the heart of the Jewish people is a particular responsibility for Elijah. Now where it says there that he will turn, in verse 6, turn the hearts of the fathers, it's the Hebrew word shub, S H U. WB. And it can also mean to, to bring back or to restore. So he's going to restore or bring back the heart of the fathers to the children. Now when he says the fathers, well that's a theme in scripture, isn't it? If someone was to ask us, well who are the fathers of Israel? It's not hard to say. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are the fathers of Israel. And this little statement is that Elijah's work is to restore the heart or the disposition of their fathers, the faithfulness of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to the children. That's the spirit they'll take on as they become the true seed of Abraham. Um, there's an interesting little passage actually, which you might want to note down in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, where these words are taken and given an incipient fulfillment or an initial fulfillment in the life of John the Baptist. And the meaning of this phrase, turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, is elaborated on, and particularly in the second section there, the heart of the children to their fathers in that passage. So what it's telling us is that children are going to be converted to think like the fathers of old, that the spirit of the patriarchs, the way of thinking of the patriarchs, will be instilled into the hearts of the children. And he will do for that generation what Moses did for the previous generation as he led them out of the captivity to the promised land. By the way, can you think of any other passage in scripture where Moses and Elijah appear together? So, the transfiguration? That is, yes, the transfiguration. Let's have a look at that actually. Luke chapter 9, the transfiguration. Some quite interesting little statements made, particularly in the, the Luke Gospel record, Luke chapter 9. And we say, what, what an interesting thing that we have both Moses and Elijah appearing together beside the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. <clears throat> Came to pass after eight days, about an eight days afterwards, after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Verse 30. Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. Now notice it doesn't just say they stood with him two men. It says they talked with him two men. And then it tells us what the heck she talked about. Verse 31, they appeared in glory, and they spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And that word deceased is the Greek word exodus. So here are Moses and Elijah talking with the Lord Jesus Christ about the exodus which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Because of course Moses had led, led an exodus from Egypt, historically. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to, was going to lead the greatest exodus of all from sin and death. 
and Elijah will lead the exodus of the future as Israel is brought out of the nations and brought back to the promised land again. So Elijah is going to be the man who speaks as the voice to the heart of God's people. There's actually a number of other passages which talk about Elijah being involved in that work. Uh, Matthew 11 verses 13 to 15 and Matthew 17 verses 10 to 13. It's also interesting to see how the role of John the Baptist is very closely linked to the work of Elijah. Well, there's a good reason for that. John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah, as the angel told his father. He was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to those in the land before the first coming of Christ. Elijah will be sent to those who are outside of the land before the second coming of Christ. Well, there's an interesting parallel that runs there between the work of John the Baptist and the future work of Elijah. Okay, so will Elijah go out on this, on this journey on his splendid lonesome? Will there just be one solitary figure sort of trudging the world stage by himself with this particular message? Well, we'll use our pattern again. Let's think about the, the time when Moses appeared before Pharaoh. And what he did first was gather of the elders of Israel and he appeared before, uh, before Pharaoh with Aaron and with the elders of Israel. Now, if you were Elijah and you're going out in the future, who would be the very best people that you could gather around you to go on that mission? Well, surely representatives of those who are already in the land, who have already been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, those known as Judah, can you imagine them being involved in going out to their persecuted brethren with a message of hope? These are people who have already been through terrible circumstances and redeemed and ransomed by the Lord Jesus Christ and they will be going forth with Elijah with that message to their oppressed brethren. We know that from a number of passages. Zechariah 10 verse 3 speaks about the fact that God's going to use Judah in this next phase. Yahweh has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and has made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Then we've got Isaiah 66, verse 19 and 20. I'll set a sign among them. I will send those that escape of them into the nations, to the isles of far off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, and they shall bring your brethren for an offering unto Yahweh out of all nations. Notice two things there again. There's a declaration of the glory of God to these nations. It's part of the, the, the command for them to submit. And then also bringing your brethren back as an offering unto Yahweh out of all nations. And the end result in Jeremiah 3 verse 18 is that in those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They'll come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given unto your fathers. The RSV says well, Judah will join with the house of Israel and come together. Now these representatives of Judah that go out will of course still be mortal, but based on the passages in Joel, they will probably have the power of the Holy Spirit. And what, what better group to send out the message together with Elijah to their scattered brethren that it's time for them to return to the Lord. Now of course it's our hope that as the immortal saints, we will also be involved very much in this work. We know we will from passages uh, like Psalm 149, but it may be that we are not as visible in the process as Elijah and those of the household of Judah um, initially. But there's that beautiful passage actually in Psalm 68 verse 11, Yahweh gave the word, great was the company of those that published it. So we'll be out there with this message to all of the nations to submit, and for the Jewish people to be released and brought back to their land again. Now the message which is preached to Israel will not just be a message of personal safety, of security, but it's going to specifically address their spiritual state because there's a change of heart that's required. And there are a number of passages which describe in a beautiful way what the message is that the still small voice will, will, will pronounce as, as he goes out to speak to the heart of the scattered of Israel. 
Jeremiah 3, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith Yahweh. I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith Yahweh, and I will not keep anger for ever. Only acknowledge thy iniquity that thou hast transgressed against Yahweh thy God. You can hear the entreaty. Turn, O backsliding children, saith Yahweh. I am married to you. I'll take you. One of a city, two of a family, I will bring you to Zion. And here's God sending this message out via his mouthpiece, Elijah. And he's saying, come and respond. Return to me. Come back to me and I'll gather you. One of a city, two of a family, I'll bring you back to Zion where you belong. Or Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7. This is a message which we'll be communicating to those of Israel. Seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto Yahweh and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Now that message is going to be conveyed to a people who at that point in time are being persecuted beyond measure. Just as the message of Moses was to those of Israel who were being persecuted by Pharaoh and by his officers. The Jewish people at that stage will be groaning under the persecution and the bondage of a world that's trying to exterminate them. They're actually described as being outcasts ready to perish in Isaiah 27 verse 13. That's quite a strong phrase. Just think about what that means. In the nations of the world they'll be outcasts ready to perish. Um, just a, over the last few weeks, before we were at the Bible School, we had the opportunity to look at some of the Jewish museums in Prague um, and Vienna and Venice. And, and it's just staggering. We know the history of Europe. Go through, even in this country actually, at one, at one period, also in Spain in 1492. The number of times down through history where nations have suddenly turned around and railed against the Jews and either tried to kick them out or suppress them or punish them, the passages of Scripture show that that's exactly what's going to take place again. And it's people that are suffering like that who will be receiving this message or this entreaty to respond. And their response will absolutely move us, brothers and sisters. Psalm 110 verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. They need help. They need salvation. Or Hosea 6, verses 1 to 3, Come, let us return unto Yahweh. For he hath torn, but he'll heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. Or Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And so we know that there will be this glorious response from the people of Israel. And so they'll try to leave. What did Pharaoh do when Israel tried to leave? Just like Pharaoh of old, the very nations who have just been oppressing them will not let them go. Ironically, they'll hold them back as captives. So Pharaoh... Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not Yahweh, neither will I let Israel go. Jeremiah 50, verse 33. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together. All that took them captives held them fast. They refused to let them go. And when we have those words in Isaiah that we're familiar with, when he says... I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Why does he say to the north, give up? Why does he say to the south, keep not back? Because that's exactly what they will be trying to do. So that, at that point, we'll have this terrible impasse. There'll be a message that's gone to the Jews. They'll want to respond. They'll want to come back to their land. But the very nations that are persecuting them and trying to destroy them won't let them go. So what now? Well, at that point, something rather extraordinary and quite wonderful happens. Actually, something completely unexpected as far as the nations of the earth are concerned. 
because suddenly the tables will be returned. Sorry, the tables will be turned. Suddenly redeemed, we're going to find that, that, that Israel, working together with Elijah, those that are with him, and, and also with us as the saints, these poor people, the downtrodden of Israel, will rise up against their enemies, rise up against their oppressors. So the captive will then become the captor. The vanquished will become the conqueror. And there's an appropriateness, isn't there, that the very people who have been persecuted by the nations, the Jewish people, will become the vehicle for God to, to wreak his fury and punishment upon the nations that have oppressed them. So just think, for example, of the, of the story of Esther again, the story of Esther once more. Remember, after Mordecai and Queen Esther had appealed to Ahasuerus, and think there of Christ and the saints, They've interceded on behalf of the Jews to the king, and the king publishes a decree. And a decree goes out, but this time the decree supports the Jewish people. And we read from Esther chapter 8 and verse 10, He wrote in King Ahasuerus' name, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people. And, prevent, and the province that would assault them, both little ones and children, and then take the spoil of them for a prey. And we know what happened, don't we, in the, in the story of Esther. We read in verses 15 and 17 of that chapter that the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad that suddenly the Jewish people had light and gladness and joy and honour. says, ironically, many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. And then it goes on in great detail to describe the battles that took place and what the ultimate outcome was. You know, we actually can't help but be impressed by the very graphic way Scripture describes the work of the Jews now fighting against the nations as they return back to their land. There's a whole abundance of quotes that talk now about Israel being used to actually punish their oppressors. Here's a few of them. I've got a couple of slides here, and you, you just, it's really amazing to see how many passages describe this process. Zechariah 10, verses 3 to 7, Judah as the battle horse. talks about mighty men treading down their enemies in the street as mighty men fighting because Yahweh is with them. Or Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13, God says, I have bent Judah like a bow. He's filled the bow with Ephraim, and that they will be like the sword of a mighty man. So here's the, the Jewish people fighting against their oppressors. Isaiah 41 verse 14. Fear not thou worm Jacob and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith Yahweh, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth of iron. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills as chaff. Or Jeremiah 51, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations. Or Obadiah, verse 18, The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for stubble. They will kindle in them and devour them, and there will not be any remaining, for Yahweh has spoken it. Or Micah 4, verse 13, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, I will make thine horn iron and make thy hooves brass. Thou shalt beat in pieces many people. I will consecrate thee again unto the Lord. Can you see how many passages there are in Scripture that speak of the Jewish people now with the tables turned, rising against their enemies and actually being used by God to punish the very nations who have oppressed them. I quite like the way Brother Thomas describes it in his little booklet, Mystery of the Covenant. He said, in time to come, they have to give battle to their oppressors and by victory after victory to retire valiantly through to the wilderness. And then begins a rather remarkable journey for these people. Now we haven't got time this afternoon to go through it, but the actual process of the wilderness uh, as it's described is quite extraordinary and there's a remarkable amount of information in Scripture. The territory of the kingdom will be roughly, as described, as, as depicted there, covering the areas um, that are conveyed to, to Abraham, from the river of Egypt up to the Euphrates or the Nile, uh, and across from sea through to sea, and it would appear that it goes right through across to the Persian Gulf. 
a total region uh, which is known as the wider region of Eden itself. And it would appear from a number of the passages that the scattered of Israel will be brought back into that land, both from the north, from the area of Assyria, and up from the south, from the region of Egypt. And there are a lot of passages that talk about them crossing over the Persian Gulf and across the Nile and the Tongue uh, and, the, um, and the, the Red Sea from the region of Egypt. The details then talk about how they'll wander again in the wilderness. There are passages which speak of them being brought back into the covenant. The fact that water will spring forth, fountains in the desert, that the desert will blossom as a rose. It's a very familiar passage, isn't it? The desert blossoming as a rose. It's actually a passage which speaks of the restoration of Israel as they're brought back towards their land. Ezekiel 20 talks about the rebels being purged out from among them. Where the scriptures describe which nations will support them, those that will use their navy and their fleets to transport them back to the land. How Elijah will bring them up to the borders of the land of Israel, actually to the very same place that Moses brought them to. The very same place actually where Moses went when he left them to die. The very same place where Elijah was taken away from. That's the place where they will be brought back to again. It appears the Lord Jesus Christ himself will cross over out of the land to meet them and to bring them over, just like Joshua brought them into the land in the days of old. There are passages which describe them being brought up into the land of Israel, coming in through the valley of Achor, where Israel crossed through in the days of old. It talks about how they'll meet together with Judah and rejoice, how they'll approach the holy city with tears and rejoicing. There are passages which speak about the gold and the silver and the spoil which they bring from all nations, how it'll be brought up to complete the building of the house of God. There are passages which speak about the land settlement as they're given territories by lot to settle them and the allocated land. There are passages which speak of the building program to house this new multitude, about the economic foundations that will be put in place. There's even a little hint, actually, um, that it might be a 20% flat tax rate. It's just a little hint in, uh, in one of the parables, or one of the, the types. Uh, there's discussions about how other nations will assist in the work of building the temple, and about which nations and regions will then supply the offerings to be offered on the altar. There's an extraordinary richness of scripture talking about this particular process. It, it is a very vast and mag magnificent theme of scripture. And, and God willing, you and I will be there to witness as these things are actually being fulfilled. Think of the mountains of Israel as they are today. Think of the dryness of the hills of Judea. Think of the Negev desert. And then we know from Ezekiel 36, verse 35, that it will become like the Garden of Eden. We'll be there, walking through the land as that tra transformation takes place. Can you imagine a green verdure taking over all those hills? A land that will be then watered with the rain of heaven. A land described as a land that Yahweh thy God careth for. Trees, shrubs, flowers bursting forth. Every inch of the soil fertile and enriched. There will be a, a blossoming of beauty in that land in a way that we would find hard to imagine today. But there's one aspect actually that I, I long to see, to be involved with, God willing, is the process of changing the attitude of the world towards God's people. Now, won't it be very satisfying to see this, this terrible anti-Semitism that's in the world even today, it's the curse of Deuteronomy 28, being replaced by a reverential respect? Let's have a look at these passages. Behold, at that time, Zephaniah 3, verse 19, I'll save her that halteth, I'll gather her that was driven out, I'll get them praise and fame in every land where they've been put to shame. So every land that has shamed the Jews, they'll have fame and praise in those lands. Isaiah 60, verse 14, All that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. It doesn't matter whether they're Russian or German, American, British or New Zealanders. Everybody that has despised Israel will come and bow at their feet. You know how rich and famous people are, are noticed in the streets today? 
I don't know who the rich and famous people are in Britain, but if they're walking down the village that streets outside there, someone will suddenly say, oh, you see that? That's such and such. Oh, look. And they're well known as they go walking down the streets. Well, the Jews will be like that. The description of Scripture is that, is that they'll actually be recognised. People will lean forward and say in hushed tones, oh, that's, that's one of God's people. Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them. They have a seed that Yahweh has blessed. Isaiah 61 and verse 9. People will call them, oh, the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. Isaiah 62 and verse 12. And people will say, here goes one of God's people. That's the level of honour and esteem which they will have in the earth. There are passages which speak of the other nations of the earth actually becoming their servants to actually serve the Jewish people. In fact, I'd like you to come with me to Isaiah 61 because there's a particular reason why the nations of the earth will become the servants of the Jewish people. Isaiah 61, verse 4. They'll build the old wastes, they'll raise up the former desolations, they'll repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Verse 5. Strangers will stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the alien will be your ploughmen and your vine dressers. So the other nations will say, well, can I, can I come and, and look after your flocks for you? Can I come and labour in your vineyard and, and dress your vines and do that work for you? Why? Verse 6, but ye shall be named the priests of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. So other nations will say, you have a role to be, to be priests amongst us. So how about we come and we'll give you a hand. We'll, we'll work on your fields. We'll look after your vineyards. We'll look after your flocks. Can you go and do that role of being priests? Because remember, of course, Israel were called upon to be a priestly nation. God's purpose has not been given up on. And the nations will do what they can to support that. Right, so where does that leave us, brothers and sisters, here and now, in 2018? Let's revisit a passage which we put up at the beginning this evening, which speaks of the restoration of Israel. It's a passage that says, If the casting away of Israel brought reconciliation to the world, then the receiving of Israel will bring again life from the dead. I want you to park that and come with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, where we're going to find a rather remarkable thing. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. Now Romans chapter 5 is speaking of the work of atonement in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. Well, actually, pick up the connection, verse 8. God commendeth his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Consider those words carefully. What's the Apostle saying? If the death of his son reconciled us to God, then the life of his son brings salvation. Can you see what the Apostle has done in this passage and in Romans 10? Let's put them side by side. If the casting away of Israel brought reconciliation to the world, then the receiving of Israel will bring life from the dead. If the death of his son reconciled us to God, then the life of his son will save us. He's paralleled the fallen restoration of Israel with the death and resurrection of Christ. He's linked the restoration of Israel with the work of atonement in Christ. Now you recall at the outset I said that the subject of the restoration of Israel is the second most prolific subject in Scripture after the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? It's actually one and the same thing. 
because the work of reconciliation which he has accomplished in his son will then be reflected again in the reconciliation of the world when Israel is restored. The reconciliation of the world to God through the death and resurrection born son. And what's actually happening is the great work of salvation through Christ is being reflected in the restoration of Israel and the redemption of the whole earth through that process as well. What that means, brothers and sisters, is we cannot separate ourselves from the hope of Israel. So let's conclude by, by going back to Revelation chapter 11. And this time I'd like us, to, or chapter, um, chapter 11, and this time I'd like us to pick up in verse 25. I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. We're living on borrowed time, brothers and sisters. The fullness of the Gentiles is almost complete. It won't be long before Israel is restored to her rightful place. At that point, all Israel will be saved. And well might we exclaim with the Apostle Paul in verse 33, O the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So brothers and sisters, young people, we cannot separate our hope from the hope of Israel. So let's make sure, as we did actually in the hymn before, continually pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's bless Israel. Let's long for the day of their redemption in our prayers. And let's always recognise the distinctiveness of the truth that we rejoice in, that truly it is the hope of Israel. So let's long for the day when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel shall be saved.